Hello and welcome to your online lecture for chapter 14. I'm Dr. Cosby. I'm really excited to be talking about um, the different drugs that can be used to treat patients with diabetes malicious. Obviously, we know, um, if you don't know, um, that athletic trainers would not be administering any of the drugs that patients with diabetes might have, but it still becomes important to understand their mechanism of action. So I'll be speaking generally about the different drug classes, but I think what I'm really hoping you get from this online lecture kind of is a uh, better understanding of the role of, of the athletic trainer in managing student athletes who have um, diabetes in understanding probably better um, the therapeutic goals uh, um, for treatment of patients with with diabetes and I probably say most importantly being able to kind of recognize the signs and symptoms um, of potential life threatening problems for patients with diabetes and then to encourage them to participate in sports so with all that being said, um, I do want to back up and say there are two required lectures for this week. One of them is an actual YouTube video that I did not record, um, but I think it's important for us to understand how we would normally regulate glucose and insulin um, and particularly really truly blood sugar um, in a healthy model in order to understand what things go awry when a patient actually has diabetes. So if you have not watched the YouTube video first on the, um, the what do we call it, negative feedback loop, please stop here, go watch that video, and then come back to this lecture. It will make more sense. So let's go ahead and start with just defining what diabetes malicious is. Um, it's the first group of disorders that we're going to talk about that plagues the endocrine system. So it is an endocrine disorder. Its major characteristic, at least its number one reported sign and symptom, is hyperglycemia or an increase in, in blood sugar, right? Um, and if you watch that YouTube video, you understand why blood sugar, um, an increase in blood sugar or blood glucose, right, if we're using the right word, um, is a, a problem for patients with diabetes. There are two different types of diabetes. You have type 1 and you have type 2. Um, but before we even start talking about the different types, I want to share something with you that maybe hopefully opens your eyes a little bit to the pandemic of diabetes, right? Approximately 29 million patients or people have diabetes in the United States alone. That doesn't include any other country. What's more interesting to me is that about a third of those patients, third of these patients don't even realize that they actually have diabetes. They don't know it yet, right? They don't, the symptoms aren't so great that they're going to see a physician, right? So we have a large number of patients who have diabetes. And then more scary to me is we have a larger number of patients who don't even know or walking around feeling healthy and don't even know they actually have diabetes yet, right? Okay, so with that statistic being said, we have two different types of diabetes. You have type one um, and you have type two. Your type one is gonna occur in less than 10% of the patient population that we're talking about, right? So if we're saying, you know, 29 million, only 10% of that 29 million will be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Um, interestingly enough, type 1 diabetes used to be called juvenile diabetes. Um, and that was because most often type 1 diabetes is going to be going to be diagnosed um, before the age of 20 most often, right? So before the age of 20, patients will know if they have type 1 diabetes. That isn't to say for my letter of the law students that a patient who's 25 couldn't be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. A large percent of patients that are diagnosed with type 1 are age 20 and, and below. In your type 1 diabetics, they do not make insulin. And we're going to move to another slide and, and talk about the fact that most often type 1 diabetes is caused by some type of autoimmune disease where the, your own antibodies start to um, attack the pancreas. Another, We'll get there. Um, but these patients are going to require daily insulin therapy. So daily insulin injections, they're going to have an insulin pump, right? Because they can't produce insulin given that they have the autoimmune disease. Your type 2 diabetic patients represent 90% um, 
of, of patient cases or individuals that are diagnosed with di- diabetes annually. Um, and so it's the most common form of diabetes, at least in the United States. And so one of the things that we see happening is that this is actually on a rise. So your textbook says 29 million and your textbook we know is probably outdated by now. So we're looking at a more than likely 32 to 34 million people who are plagued by diabetes and we're probably going to see continue to see an increase in the number of people who be who are being diagnosed with diabetes why what do we know about type 2 diabetes versus type 1 hopefully you said well type 1 diabetes is usually brought on by an autoimmune disease and type 2 diabetes there are two things number one it's usually diagnosed in patients 40 or above it's going to include me yikes Um, And then the other thing that we know um, that type 2 diabetes has a positive correlation to is obesity and sedentary lifestyle. And we've seen seen an increase in both of these things, right? Um, And this, let's go with gaming, computers. We'll blame it on cell phones, right? So people are less active over time, um, which leads to obesity, right? And so these two risk factors, we'll call them risk factors, um, lead to the development of type 2 diabetes, as does being over the age of 40, right? So we have type 2 diabetes that is most often caused by something in our lifestyle. It could be diet as well. And then we have type 1, which we're born with and is more genetic and caused by an autoimmune disease, okay? So let's take that video, and I'm going to do this quickly for you because I believe that learning over time is extremely important. And the video, um, she did a really good job. I I, I usually don't use the um, YouTube videos very often, but she did such a good job explaining the healthy process of kind of homeostasis between glucose and insulin, right? And she talked a lot about the negative feedback loop, right? And um, a negative feedback loop being um, something that returns something to um, homeostasis or to a normative level, right? So in this case, let's look at a patient who, I don't know, maybe they just ate breakfast, right? Um, and so that breakfast was full of car- carbs, And so when the body digests that and breaks it down, what we typically will see is a rise, obviously, in glucose um, circulating within the blood. So we have this increase in glucose levels, right? That increase in glucose will trigger this anatomical structure right here, the pancreas. Now, we know that the pancreas has um, these endocrine cells known as the the islets of Langerhans. And within the islets of Langerhans, we have two different cells. We have our beta cells, right? And we have our alpha cells way over here on the left-hand side. The beta cells um, typically will respond to a rise in glucose levels, right? So when glucose levels rise, that stimulates the beta cells um, to produce insulin. The beta cells produce insulin, right? That insulin is then released from the pancreas um, and transported into the the bloodstream, right? It enters into the bloodstream, as you can see here, and it does a couple of different things. It's going to attach to the um, liver and eventually um, allow glucose to attach to it and move into the liver creating a reduction in the amount of glucose, right, Um, circulating within the blood. But then the other thing that we know that it does is it travels into our MSK, our musculoskeletal system, so our muscles, um, and our muscles will use that glucose for energy. And that's huge, right? Um, Especially if we are an athlete, um, if we are a weightlifter, that that glucose that sits in the bloodstream can be utilized as energy within the the muscle cells. And so this this is natural, right? This is a beautiful thing. When we have this rise in glucose, the pancreas gets stimulated, the pancreas, the pancreas, um, get stimulated, those beta cells within the islands of Langerhans um, produce insulin. That insulin enters into the bloodstream. Once it enters into the bloodstream, it attaches to receptors on um, the liver um, and the the muscle cells, right? Or, or fat cells as well. But the key, two key 
anatomical structure going to be liver, muscle. Um, and so when that insulin attaches to the liver and to the muscles, that allows glucose to be transported into those two anatomical structures, right? If it travels into the liver, we know um, through the process of glycogenesis, right, um, that it then becomes stored as glycogen, right? So we can see that there. If it travels into the muscle, it is then used as energy, maybe in the form of ATP, creating or allowing our muscles to contract more forcefully and more efficiently, right? And that's beautiful. And if we can get glucose into the liver where it's stored as glycogen, or if glucose can move into those muscle cells, then what happens? Glucose levels um, go back to a normative state, right? And we're using all of the glucose for, for energy, or it's stored here, right? Um, and it's stored as glycogen there, and it waits to be utilized again in our energy system, right? And that's a beautiful thing. So we have glucose in the liver being converted to glycogen, and we call that process the process of glycogenesis. And so then what happens? Um, we know this happens, right? This right here in this bottom left-hand corner, this happens to all of us. We get so busy, I don't know, rushing to clinicals, me teaching, life happens, driving back and forth, and we forget to to eat lunch, right? And so when we forget to eat lunch, maybe the blood glucose levels actually drop. So then what do we do to increase blood glucose levels um, to restore it back to a kind of homeostatic space? Well, if blood glucose levels drop, that's going to stimulate the pancreas as well. And again, inside of those endocrine cells, those islets of Langerhans cells, we have cells called alpha cells. The alpha cells then get, get triggered due to a decline in glucose, right? They cause the release of glucagon, glucagon into the bloodstream, so you can see that there. And that stimulates the process of glycolysis. And so when we think about something that has a lysis at the end, we, that means it breaks down something. So remember that glycogen that was being stored way over here in the liver, right, and, be, and, and just waiting to be used, that glycogen is now being broken down into glucose. And that glucose is then going to do what? Be released back into the bloodstream, hopefully bringing up blood glucose levels back to a normative state. Now, all of this happens in a healthy model, but the question becomes what happens when we have patients who have diabetes, right? Let us first start with talking about type 1 diabetes. As you'll recall, I just spent about eight minutes discussing the process and you have a full YouTube video on that. But normally this is what happens in our body, right? Um, when we have an increase in blood sugar levels, what's going to happen? You all can walk me through this. Those beta cells located within the islands of Lagerhand are going to release that insulin, right? Insulin's going to do a few different things. It's going to serve as kind of a transporter for glucose so that glucose can um, be up can can be up taken into the the liver where it's stored as glycogen um, or into the muscle where it's going to be used for for energy um, but then it also helps regulate uh, glucose levels right um, f fatty acid and amino acid metabolism more to come on that but when we're thinking about a type 1 diabetic, let's look at it here. Most often, type 1 diabetes is caused by that autoimmune disease. So the patient's antibodies, like literally your the beta cells are being destroyed by the patient's own antibodies, right? So these patients do not and cannot produce insulin because the, the beta cell function is literally destroyed. Um, and it's the patient's own body doing that. So most often, it's linked to some type of autoimmune disease, right? Scary enough, as those antibi um, so those antibodies be, uh, destroy the beta cells, um, over time we get no insulin production. And so then obviously, if we don't have insulin, then we know that it can't facilitate glucose uptake into the liver and into the muscles. It can't regulate glucose or fatty acid, amino acid metabolism. And so what we tend to see over time is that um, the patient will develop hyperglycemia, right? And if we're defining that, that's just increase in blood glucose or an unfancy way to say that, 
lots of sugar within the actual blood, right? Um, and if you don't know why that happens, it's because we don't have any insulin in the body, right, to facilitate the movement of glucose out of the blood and into the cells, right? Now, the hard part with hypo- hyperglycemia um, is that as hyperglycemia is sustained and it worsens, those blood glucose levels can increase, right? The hard thing with that is as they start to increase, um, it that exceeds the ability of the kidney to kind of reabsorb the glucose um, through its active uptake mechanism. And so then what you start to see is exactly what you see here. Glucose starts to spill into the actual urine, right? And we're going to talk about what happens with this particular mechanism on the next slide. But hopefully that makes sense. We have so much glucose in the blood that the kidney can't reabsorb it, right? And so then it's the sugar just starts to get excreted into the urine. And so that leads to several different signs and symptoms, which cause other related signs and symptoms. The first thing that we see is that because sugar is being excreted more frequently, what we typically see is an increase in urination um, or one of the three P's known as polyurea, right? And if we're frequently urinating, does that make sense? Um, then what we typically will see is we're losing fluid, yes? And so then that patient will also have excessive thirst or polydipsia. And because we're frequently urinating, um, we are also expending calories. And so guess what? That patient will suffer from polyphagia or increased hunger. So we can see how the three Ps are most definitely linked to one another. Now, because we're frequently urinating, um, believe it or not, that actually increases the caloric intake. And so what we typically will see is we're losing ca- more calories than we're actually putting in. So that patient may suffer from, from weight loss. Uh, down this list, we could keep going down this list. Um, your patient's going to suffer from more frequency of infections. And that really has to do with the fact that they are insulin dependent. And so they're going to require some sort of injection, whether that's with a syringe, whether that's with a diabetic pen, whether that's with an insulin pump, they're going to require some type of um, injection into the subcutaneous tissue to inject um, insulin. And so with that increases the risk, right, for infection in our patient. But the great thing is you can link back to antibiotic therapy lecture where you can um, think about maybe having a patient um, who's diabetic, who gets an infection, go on some type of antibiotic, right? Okay, now what we know about type 1 diabetic, diabetics is it's called juvenile diabetes, most often diagnosed in patients under the age of 20, but most commonly diagnosed between the ages of 10 to 15. I wanted to go back here really quickly because we're going to move to another slide. But remember, we said the B cells produce insulin, and we talked a lot about how it facilitates glucose uptake into cells. And then I mentioned this key part right here. It's also going to um, regulate fatty acid and amino acid metabolism, right? So as you're keeping that in mind, let's go ahead and talk through what happens inefficiently in a diabetic patient. As the antibodies continue to attack the beta cells, we will start to we will continue to see a decline in the amount of insulin that is really available um, and a, uh, able to transport glucose into the liver um, or into the muscle cells, where it's going to be used as as energy, right? And so then we have to have a secondary kind of backup or mechanism. And and that secondary backup is going to be um, our liver and our adipose cells. And so what happens as the amount of insulin begins to decline, those liver and adipose cells are going to begin functioning as if the blood glucose level is low, even though it's not, right? We know that because we don't have insulin, we can't transport glucose into the liver and the cells. So there's glucose already sitting in our bloodstream, but because we don't have any insulin circulating, right? The body presumes that we have a low glucose environment when we actually don't, right? And so what's going to happen is those adipose cells right here that are interpreting low blood glucose, are going to start releasing fatty acids into the bloodstream 
and then your liver is actually going to increase the production of glucose increase the production of glucose from guess what amino acids through the process of what we call is gluconeogenesis and so i kind of want to break that down just a little bit um, because number one we're at a christian school and i see the word genesis there and i think that's a time to like bring it um, but gluco we know that that's going to stand for glucose neo represents the word new and genesis is obviously the first book in the bible but i also like to think of it as um, the time where god did a lot of work doing what making things right or creating things the heavens and the earth for example the stars what else we could go on and on and on and on. Um, but isn't it neat to see how kind of God's word can translate back into things that we're talking about in this class, really just in life. But as we start thinking about defining gluconeogenesis, what we're saying is it's the formation, something new, right, of glucose from some sort of non-carbohydrate carbon structure. So again, just to repeat that, we have these adipose cells uh, that are going to be releasing fatty acids into the bloodstream. And then we have the liver through the process of gluconeogenesis, right? Creating new glucose, but they're doing that in a different way, right? They're doing, they're doing that by how? Producing glucose from amino acids, right? So we get more glucose being produced when we already have what high blood glucose levels bgl so now we have increased hyperglycemia already in a hyperglycemic environment are you not worried about this at all now we focus down here we've talked a lot about this part and what the liver and adipose cells are doing um, and why they are disadvantageous to patients with diabetes. Um, but then we also move down here to a condition that really is life-threatening known as ketoacidosis. But before we get there, um, one of the things that I want to say is that if you're a healthy patient, the release of fatty acids, gluconeogenesis, those are all good things because they're secondary energy sources that our body can use. And oftentimes they allow us to consume serve some of the glucose um, that the liver makes, right? But in healthy patients, the, the liver will um, re release keto acids um, or, or ketones into the blood. And again, this is an alternative energy source in a healthy patient um, that can be utilized to assist with energy stores. But in patients with diabetes, those keep that we can't use those keto acids in the same way or they can't use those keto acids in the same way and so what happens is that liver continues to produce the keto acids the problem is is there's no transport system for those keto acids and so they literally those keto acids that are being produced by the liver um, into the blood cell or into the blood continue to stay there right and so what do you think happens we have this decline right in ph and our blood becomes more acidic hopefully that makes sense and if we don't normalize this it leads to a condition known as ketoacidosis which is absolutely life-threatening okay and can take a patient's life so what are some signs and symptoms of ketoacidosis well one of the number one signs and symptoms of ketoacidosis is going to be fruity breath so you're talking to a patient you're taking um you're taking a history and you start to smell like this sweet breath right almost smells like the yellow wriggly gum then you're concerned right because what that means is that liver is releasing keto acids into the bloodstream and we are not utilizing them we are not uptaking them and using them as energy and so they're circulating there continuing to decrease the ph making the ph uh, relatively acidic and if that's the case if the if the body becomes so acidic what we know is that the patient can actually die from from ketoacidosis um, so we need to correct it and most often the correction is going to be to inject guess what 
insulin to normalize. Diabetic ketoacidosis, extremely life-threatening because of the drop in the pH, um, usually occurs two ways, illness in a diabetic, diabetic, um, or missing insulin shots, right? Um, it, it could also be that the insulin pump is clogged, right? Or you give the wrong in, insulin dose. So any of these four things can cause ketoacidosis, right? Which Okay, let's think about this from an athletic training standpoint. It's important for us to understand that, right? Because as we think through our role of working with patients who have diabetes, it's really in the management of those patients, right? Making sure they don't miss their shots, making sure if they're ill that their body is processing the insulin that they put into it properly, making sure they understand when to recognize that their insulin pump is clogged. And then in newbies, people who are most recently diagnosed, we know that they struggle the most with figuring out the proper dosing regimen right away. So in terms of signs and symptoms, I mentioned the breath will uh, will absolutely smell very, very, very fruity. Um, they may vomit or have difficulty breathing. And then the big key thing is we want to assess blood sugar. Um, so any blood sugar that's above 240, they're going to the ER um, specifically if it's above 300. So 300 would be the threshold. And most athletic trainers that have diabetic patients will have a blood glucose monitor. You can see that here. They're relatively cheap. You can buy them over the counter at any Rite Aid store and prevention is going to be key. What do I mean by that? It means monitoring blood glucose levels, making sure if you have it, uh, an ill patient who has diabetes, that again, they're dosing correctly, um, monitoring their blood glucose levels as much as is possible. Um, getting close to your patients, right? This is a hard one, um, but it's a key diagnostic uh, criteria for patients who have diabetic ketoacidosis. And the key thing is as soon as you can inject that insulin, that will reduce the diabetic ketoacidosis and hopefully relieve some of the signs and symptoms for your patient. That was the physiology for type 1 diabetes. Let's talk through the physiology for type 2 diabetes. I imagine that it might be a little bit easier just because you understand the negative feedback loop and you understand the different processes. So a type 2 diabetic, remember, they continue to produce insulin. That actually isn't their issue. The true underlying cause or defect is the existence of what we call is insulin resistance, right? So these patients, for whatever reason, um, they're the muscle, the liver, the adipose tissue, they just don't respond to the insulin. Maybe there's not enough receptors on that um, liver for transport of glucose into the cell. Maybe um, you need more of the insulin to trigger um, the receptors. But for whatever reason, that patient is insulin resistant, right? The scary thing with type 2 diabetics, and I said this early on, is that they may be in asymptomatic for years and this is the hardest part with a type 2 diabetic is they can go undiagnosed so what happens over time is this system down here that we've talked through the patient produces insulin for whatever reason they're insulin resistant or it may be that the negative feedback loop is just out of sync and so the release of insulin isn't necessarily coupled with the increase in in glucose levels and so major difference between type 1 type 2 type 1's autoimmune type 2 we definitely produce insulin but for whatever reason we become insulin resistant right we know, maybe this is on the next slide, that the patients that we're going to see this most often happening in are patients over the age of 40, and then patients who are sedentary um, or obese. So those are the three types of patients that we'll see come into the clinic. Most of you won't be working with patients over the age of 40, sedentary or obese patients, unless of course you're going into physical therapy. Because type 2 diabetes isn't a um, just an insulin-driven disease, um, there are key hormones that we probably should talk about um, in this process. And so they're listed here on this slide. You have your incretins, your glucagon, and your amylin. Um, and I've listed the function of each of these hormones so that you could see just how important they are in um, balancing out um, the amount of insulin and 
um, glucose that are circulating within the blood. So your anch- your anchoritins, um, they're they're released by the gastrointestinal tract um, when we eat food, right? And so then they increase the release of insulin, which makes sense. If we eat food, we know that most often if it's carbohydrate, it's going to be broken down um, into glucose, which will then go into the blood and that will trigger the pancreas and the beta cells, right? Um, to release insulin, that insulin will bind to the liver, to the muscles, where it will then transport the glucose out of the blood and into the liver or into the muscles, right? So we can see how this is advantageous. The other thing that it does um, is it preserves the insulin producing capacity of the beta cells. Um, And this is extremely important, um, particularly in, in patients who might be insulin resistant, right? It decreases appetite, which we'll talk about in a second. A lot of patients that have type 2 diabetes, what what do we typically see? An increase in weight gain um, because incretin is inhibited, which means they have increased appetite capacity and it's going to reduce uh, glucagon release, right? It's going to reduce glucagon release. So then we have glucagon, right? So we have incretins, we have uh, glucagon. Glucagon is important because it's going to increase blood glucose level by causing the breakdown of glycogen. And this is important, right? So let's say we skip that meal. Remember that that meal we skip that the alpha cells would get triggered um, and then they re- cause the release of glucagon, which stimulates the breaking down of glycogen into glucose so that glucose can be released into the actual blood to bring the blood glucose level back up, right? This is great. This is what we want. We want the balance between the two, right? We want to increase um, the release of insulin when we need it. We also want to increase the release of glucose when we need it. So we have these two key hormones and then we have amylin. Amylin is going to decrease GI um, motility, which is a good thing. It allows for food and other items to be absorbed, right? Slows down the rate of glucose absorption. Um, It's going to decrease the glycemic enhancing effects of glucagon on the liver, and it's going to decrease appetite. So each of these three key hormones are extremely important in regulating um, glucose, insulin, and appetite. And all of these three hormones most often are impacted in a type 2 diabetic. In other words, most often they um, may be inhibited in some way, shape, or form. So it will become important as we talk through the different types of medications that are going to be utilized in a type 2 patient. Keep in mind that they'll all be kind of targeted at some of these key hormones. We could spend a ton of time talking about how we can reduce the risk for developing type 2 diabetes or how we can reduce the signs and symptoms associated with type 2 diabetes, but I will resist the urge to do that. But yet I do want to draw attention to um, the non-myofidal, myofidal, oh my goodness, modifiable risk factors, um, and then the modifiable risk factors, right? So there are things that we can change, and then there are things that we absolutely can't change. One thing to consider um, is race and ethnicity. Um, For me as an athletic trainer, I would want to know which of my athletes are more at risk for the development of uh, diabetes. So African American, Native American, Latina American, Asian American, Pacific Islanders. Those are going to be the kind of five key Um, racial group or ethnic groups that will um, that you might see presenting to you with diabetes right we can't do anything about age I truly wish that we could we can't do anything about genetics let's say there's an autoimmune disease but what we can do are look at things that are modifiable right and so as you all get older maybe you have your own families or maybe it's just you in particular right the screen time whether that's phone ipad tablet, etc. You want to reduce that and get get your kids or get yourself outside. Recommendation is what? 30 minutes of activity, right? Um, At least three times a week, if not more. Yes, if you're um, overweight and obese, we can fix that, right? I'm not saying it's easy. There are behavioral changes that need to happen, but certainly. And then dietary habits, again, not an easy change depending on. So we can see that there are things that we can modify for sure and that we would want to modify and that we can control as athletic trainers. And then there are going to be things that, I mean, let's be real. There's nothing that we can do about it. 
So then we just have to say to ourselves, if the diabetes is occurring and it's as a result of a non-modifiable risk factor, what things can we do as athletic trainers to reduce the signs and symptoms associated with the actual disease? There are so many complications that arise um, from diabetes, so many concomitant kind of diseases and disorders that we as athletic trainers should certainly be aware of, particularly if we have a young athlete who's participating in sport. The two that I'm going to highlight and the two of probably concern are going to be the development of heart disease and or stroke. And we will see this oftentimes in your type 2 diabetics who are taking some medications where there's an increased risk um, to actually develop heart disease and or stroke. So this can diabetes can be a life-threatening disease if not managed well. What we also know about diabetic patients is they have poor um, poor blood flow, unfortunately. And so oftentimes, particularly in your type 2 diabetics, you'll see amputations typically of the, the lower limb itself. And the big key thing when we're traveling with patients who um, are learning how to manage blood sugar or glucose levels is they will oftentimes suffer from hyper hypoglycemic episodes, which means a decline in blood glucose levels. And so we'll have to figure out what do we do for them. And I'll talk about that um, traveling with patients who have diabetes and what we do to treat both hyperglycemic glycemic episodes and hypo uh, glycemic episodes. So why am I putting this on here? Because I need y'all to know that diabetes, even though we're not going to do a whole bunch of administration of medication, we certainly should understand that there are multitude of complications, uh, serious complications that can arise in patients that actually have diabetes. How does one actually get diagnosed with diabetes, right? That's really the question. Really, there are um, multiple ways that a person can get diagnosed. Um, so I'll start with, I'll just go down the list. So um, number one, you can look at your A1C levels. Your A1C levels um, are also known kind of as like a, a hemoglobin test, right? Just a simple hemoglobin test. And essentially what it does is it, it, it will measure the average okay so we're talking average um blood sugar levels and it does it over the last three months so that's a good thing right because it's also going to tell you how well your diabetic has actually been managing their insulin intake but for diagno diagnosis purposes it's going to measure the average blood sugar over three months right what we know about um sugar or glucose is what that anytime we ingest sugar or anytime sugar or glucose enters into the bloodstream, what does it attach to? It attaches to hemoglobin, um, which is a protein in our red blood cells, right? And so everybody, no judgment attached, everybody has some sort of sugar attached to their hemoglobin. But what we know about diabetic patients is that they're going to have more sugar um, attached to their hemoglobin than the healthy um, adult and or child. Hopefully that makes sense. So if we do an A1C um, blood test, essentially a patient who has um, greater than six and a half percent would be considered diabetic. If you have a patient who falls in between the 5.7% to 6.4%, then they're considered pre-diabetic, which is good because then we can monitor them. So if you have any suspicions, if the patient has those three Ps that we talked about, right, then maybe you refer out for an A1C test to look at the percent of hemoglobin that is actually occupied by the glucose. And if it's above that 6.5, typically they're diagnosed as having diabetes, right? But even if they fall into that 5.7 to 6.4%, um, you're still concerned and that's something you want to adjust all of the modifiable factors, right? A diet, weight, activity, etc. Another key way to diagnose someone with um, diabetes is a fasting plasma glucose. If they have fasted for at least eight hours and we do a plasma glucose and it's above 126, then they are diagnosed with diabetes. Um, if they have symptoms of hyperglycemia um, and a, what we call is a casual plasma glucose, so they just walk in um, and we take their glucose and that is above 200, then most often um, they're diagnosed with diabetes. But I will say this 
bullet point in particular is usually coupled then with a fasting plasma glucose the next day or an A1C test to confirm this finding. Um, the other one is a two hour plasma um, glucose test of 200 or above um, from an oral glucose tolerance test. So they take 75 grams of glucose two hours before the blood test. And if that comes back with greater than 200 milligrams, then they're diagnosed as having diabetes. What I will say in consulting the evidence for this particular class is one thing is for sure that when you have a patient who you suspect has diabetes, if you're going to be a physician someday, that the specificity increases as the number of these tests are positive right so spin remember that spin it in a positive test means what they have the disease so in this case the more positive tests we have a 1c1 fasting plasma glucose a casual plasma two hour plasma glucose the more tests that are positive the more likely and the more sure we are that they have diabetes but most often the quickest assessment is going to be that a1c blood test one of the big key things um, to a lack of patient adherence in diabetic patients is monitoring. I think this is besides learning when and how to take insulin. It's one of the most challenging parts of being a diabetic is being able to monitor blood glucose levels. And so this is where you come in. You're a major player in your diabetics um, life, which means you're going to constantly have to remind them, especially if they've been newly diagnosed to monitor their blood glucose levels, right? Um, and you're going to set goals. What are the goals for today? How how often have you checked your bl blood glucose levels? How can I help you? What's the plan that we're actually going to have? The biggest goal for a patient who has been diagnosed with diabetes is to minimize hyperglycemia, right? But the other one is also to prevent hypoglycemia as well. So what is hypoglycemia defined as um, a blood sugar level that is going to be less than seven milligrams per deciliter? There you go, right? So we want, we always want to make sure we're kind of out of that red area wherever possible, right? Because then that means the patient, what does that mean? Hypoglycemia. They have enough sugar in the body, right? Um, and then we're concerned about that component as well. So we want to reduce hyperglycemia. We want to reduce hypoglycemic episodes as much as is possible. Probably the number one goal. And the way to do that is through self-monitoring of blood glucose or what your textbook would call SMBG. Self-monitoring blood glucose, right? So what does that mean? Your blood glucose is checked several times a day. For most athletes, that's going to be at least three times a day. And we can kind of go down here and check out those three times. Preprandial means before meal. Postprandial means after meal. And then the obvious is bedtime. So what is the ADA? Gold standard, right? What do they recommend for patients who have diabetes? So if your patient is between the ages of 6 to 12 and they have diabetes before they eat a meal, the ideal blood glucose when they self-monitor would be 90 to 180, right? They haven't really recorded postprandial, but at bedtime, they don't want that. They want that blood glucose level to be about 100 to 180. If you're working with probably high school students, right, 13 to 19, that that preprandial or before meal wanted to be about 90 to 130. Um, and why is it lower? Because they should be better at regulating, right? When you compare it to your adolescent. Again, not recorded, which means they haven't studied it yet in this particular group. And then at bedtime, you want it to be around 90 to 150. And then for your adults, that's going to be most of you who want to work in the college setting. The ideal before a meal would be a 70 to 130. Remember that 70, we're getting close to hypoglycemia. So we want to be careful when they check it. And then we want a postprandial blood glucose of less than 180, right? So that means after the meal. And then there isn't anything recorded for bedtime. In addition to that, where do we want our diabetic patients to be in their A1C levels, right? The amount of sugar that is bound to the hemoglobin. So for your six to eight year old, six to 12 year olds, um, about 8%, your 13 to 19, 
13 year olds about seven and a half percent and then your um, adults about seven percent right we know that normative is going to be what for your a1c levels anybody remember go back one slide six and a half percent right so we want to make sure they're not way above the normative um or, or yeah the normative it's at this point in time in the lecture that I'm going to start to integrate the NATA um, position statement on managing athletes with diabetes. Talked about the A1C. Um, one of the things that we said is it, it measures the amount of sugar that's attached to hemoglobin. Um, and uh, we don't want that to be above six and a half, right? If it is above six and a half, then we're, we know that they're diabetic, yes? Um, but in addition to that, the A1C is a good thing because it's also a measure of how well the patient actually controls their blood glucose level. In other words, if the blood glucose level is always high, guess what we're going to see? Higher A1Cs. So it will tell a physician who will then tell the athletic trainer, can you please make sure that your patient is doing better self-monitoring glucose um, protocol, right? So it indicates, it's an indicator of glucose control over the previous two to three months. So a lot of patients, new patients will have multiple A1C uh, assessments over the year just to make sure that they're actually regulating relatively well, right? And in the adult population, remember, we want that to be at 7% and or less, which would be closer to normative thresholds. But here's what we want to really pay attention to. And this is something that the Board of Certification will assess, um, recommended by the NATA to be done every three months, right? Athletes with type 1 diabetes should have a glycosylated hemoglobin or an A1C test every three to four months to assess overall long-term glycemic control. So on the exam, they could say, how often should a patient have an A1C test? And you should say three to four months, right? And that would be good. I think it would help with your treatment plans. I think it will help you determine how much you need to walk alongside that athlete or how much you don't. We have talked a lot about physiology. We've talked a lot about um, how we diagnose diabetes. Let's talk a little bit about the treatment of diabetes. So first and foremost, let's talk about the nutritional recommendations because I always like to, if we can naturally change the progression of a disease, then that's the ideal, right? Of course, we want to use a pharmacological approach when necessary, but in our type 2 diabetes, you'll find that sometimes it's the drugs are actually not necessary. Not necessary. If we adjust um, dietary intake, and so what we're looking at over on this side is what's suggested for a patient that is a type 2 diabetic. So um, you can see that there is a third, right? A third of that patient's plate um, is going to be carbohydrates. But the majority of that patient's plate are going to be non-starchy vegetables, which then can't be broken down into carbohydrates and then cut um changed over into glucose, right? So we can see that we have a smaller portion of our plate, which would be given to carbohydrates. Some would even argue that maybe even one fourth of our plate should be carbohydrate intake, which would reduce blood glucose levels significantly, right? You all are seeing that hopefully. But you want to use a variety of sources for carbohydrates, right? I mean, come on, you know my favorites, pasta and bread, right? But there are so many other valuable sources of carbohydrates that our patients can certainly intake. Where possible, you want diets that are going to be low in fat and then low in cholesterol. That will lim limit the saturated fats and trans fats as much as possible. The great thing um, about diet that I learned um, in preparing for this particular class is you really want to consume foods such as fish, which contain the omega-3 fatty acids. Why is that? Okay, I'll give it to you. Essentially, they have been reported to reduce insulin resistance in patients with type 2 diabetes. Now, don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. That isn't to say they get rid rid of type 2 diabetes because we also know that there are some hormonal things that are occurring as well, right? With the incretins, the glucagon, the amylin, but they will reduce insulin um, insensitivity, which is a great thing. So where your patient can eat um, fish, which is rich in omega-3 or supplement that with omega-3 kinds of um, supplements, that would be good. And then we want our patients to limit alcohol consumption. Why is that? Think deep about this. 
Well, there are two major reasons. The first one is that it can contribute to ketoacidosis, which would drop the pH and lead to a very acidic environment and may lead to death in our patients. And the other thing that we see in patients who particularly type 1 patients who are injecting insulin is that it can also contribute to hypoglycemia. So again, once again, we're looking at alcohol as a a negative contributor to a lot of the diseases or illnesses that we're talking about in this particular class. Y'all, I don't even know how to say this without just saying it. Exercise is medicine. And no, I don't work for the American College of Sports Medicine. But in this particular case, I am all in, I buy in that exercise is medicine. So what did we learn? Hopefully we've learned something from the first lecture that you watched on YouTube. And then hopefully you've learned something from this lecture, which is that um, one of the things that we need to do is we want to move glucose out of the blood and into, uh, well, the muscles for the use of energy, right? And then into the liver. Well, one of the things that we know about exercise in particular with diabetic patients is that it will absolutely improve glycemic control. One of the ways in which it it does that is it facilitates the removal of, of glucose from the blood into the muscles in particular so that they can use it for energy. So exercise in this case for type 2 diabetics is absolutely medicine. Um, the research suggests um, a, a combination of aerobic exercise coupled with some type of like strength training, for example. Um, so a good type of exercise would be HIIT exercise, for example. This would be a great exercise for obese um, for diabetic patients that can handle it. Now, of course, we know for type 2 diabetics in particular, what? That most of them are sedentary. Most of them are going to be obese. Um, I should say some of them are going to be sedentary. Some of them are going to be obese. So getting them to do HIIT exercises may not be... Um, they may not be able to do that, right? So we have to know our patient. But if we can get our patients active, right, with the 30 minutes of exercise, then what we know is that it improves glycemic control. And what a better way to improve glycemic control than via exercise, right? Um, it also reduces the risk of long-term complications. An example of that, we talked about amputations. Well, if we can facilitate blood flow to those distal extremities, the risk for amputations actually um, decreases, right? And so um, one of the only concerns with exercise in patients who are injecting insulin in particular um, is that oftentimes exercise coupled with insulin and some oral medications may cause hypoglycemia. So it'll become important for athletes. This is the group I'm talking about here to make sure we are self-monitoring before, maybe even during our activity or our event, and most certainly after where we've expended a lot of, of calories. I guess I should teach you how to assess hypoglycemia on the scale. We can kind of see that here. It goes from moderate, uh, mild to severe with moderate being in between. And then you have a, noc um, a nocturnal uh, hypoglycemia, which we'll talk about separately. So on the mild end of the spectrum, the patient may be sweating. Uh, we can go down the list, may have anxiety, um, inability to concentrate. So I call this the jitters, essentially. That's what the mild phase would look like. Your moderate, we start to see some um, physiological brain um, processes, cognitive things starting to happen. So they'll have headaches, for example, confusion, blurred vision as another example, and drowsiness. And then severe, which is a concern, um, is unconsciousness and moving into a coma. And your textbook didn't say it, but death if we don't treat it quickly, right? So we have to be careful. Patient can progress relatively quickly from mild to severe. You have nocturnal hypoglycemia. Um, I had honestly never heard of this before, so it was the first time that I had the opportunity to learn about it. This is exactly as the name states. It's just a low blood sugar levels at night um, in a patient who actually it has been diagnosed with diabetes. That's the key thing. Um, particularly at night, the blood sugars may drop below the target range. Um, and that's typically because a person doesn't eat as much at dinner um, or ha maybe has dinner early, right? Does that make sense? Or maybe takes their insulin a little bit too soon. Um, so all of those things can lead to something like the patient waking up with a morning headache because they're hyperglyce hypoglycemic when they wake up. They may have night terrors, for example, profuse sweating um, or a restless sleep. So we have to make sure that 
in addition to when our patients aren't with us, that we're also giving them kind of valuable information to manage their disease when they're at home as well. Diabetes, it, for most patients, um, is often an unpredicted diagnosis. In other words, a patient goes in to see a physician because they're urinating or they have excessive hunger or they have excessive thirst and they have no idea why they have that those symptoms, right? And then they get diagnosed with diabetes. And diabetes uh, is a lifelong disease that certainly can be managed. But in terms of patient adherence, um, it's relatively one of the diseases that is poorly managed by our patients. So um, I found this information, the World Health Organization defines as adherence for long-term treatment as the extent to which a person's behavior, taking the medication, following a diet, and or executing lifestyle changes corresponds with the agreed recommendations from the healthcare provider. You ready for this? Okay. Um, The average adherence to long-term therapy for chronic diseases, diabetes included um, in developed countries is approximately 50%. Whoa, let me say that again. Approximately 50%. So 50% of the patients that you have with diabetes probably will not adhere to their um, self-monitoring, for example, insulin injections, oral medications, for example. And so we have to consider that as athletic trainers. It's extremely important. And this is all complicated by a few different things. Imagine being a patient who's diabetic. Some of you may be diabetic listening to this lecture, right? So frequent injections, sometimes you're inconvenient. You're in class. You don't want to take out your your syringe and inject yourself if you're using a syringe. You don't want to take out your pen. You don't want to have to refill your insulin pump, right? Frequent dosing. Those things alone are one of the number one reasons that we see a lack of patient adherence in patients with diabetes. There are adverse side effects, mainly with the oral medications, most often not with the um, the insulin itself, a lack of understanding of the disease, and sometimes denial, right? Um, because you go from feeling like you're healthy to knowing that you now have this lifelong disease. The other thing is financial cost, um, because we are going to have to have insulin, we are going to have to have oral medications. And then last but not least, and the one that I think is important for us as athletic trainers, is there's just a lack of, 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 a per, of, of personal support. Um, and so this is where we come in, y'all. Like if we think about all that we're called to do as athletic trainers, there's so many things. We can take care of patients. We tr- you're going to treat patients well. You're going to rehab them well. But the one thing that I feel like we're more called to do in the field of athletic training is to support our student athletes in ways that maybe their support their outside support system cannot. And so understanding diabetes and understanding how to come alongside that student athlete and work with them is extremely important. You're the key to success for patient adherence in patients with diabetes. You are the key, right? And so that begins with patient education first and foremost, uh, making, creating a safe space for the patient to actually ask questions, reinforcing long-term advantages of glycemic control, and then exercising with a team, with a friend, right? Exercise is medicine, mainly for those type 2 diabetics, not your type 1. Here are some things that I took from the NATA position statement. Um, As we think about the pre-participation physical examination for a type 1 diabetic, what are some things that we should include, right? Um, Look down here. We need to be discussing things with the athlete's endocrinologist, for example, their primary care physician, right? Um, What things do they recommend for glycemic control for that particular patient, right? In other words, this is going to be an interdisciplinary approach to treating the patient. You may even go to um, a, a few doctor's appointment to, to meet the healthcare professionals working with your student athlete who actually has diabetes, right? This would, again, increase patient adherence, right? So let's talk athletic injury and glycemic control because that's a key component, right? Trauma even in persons without diabetes, often causes a hyperglycemic state, right? Hyperglycemia is known to impair the wound healing process, which is why we sometimes see amputations. The wounds don't heal, they get infected, and we have to do what? Amputate. So for athletes with type 1 diabetes, an individualized blood glucose management protocol should be developed. Um, and then used during the injury recovery process. Make sense? 
What am I saying? It's individualized. So every diabetic that you treat is going to be different. Please don't group them all into one category. And then last but definitely not least, I'm going to use yellow, critical roles for the athletic trainer include ready prevention, recognition, and immediate care of hypo and hyperglycemia. Yes. Exercise nutrition, hydration counseling, and helping the athlete to recognize the intensity of the exercise session. You're a huge part of the athlete's success to patient adherence, um, particularly in those patients with this lifelong disease. So I just wanted to empower you all just a little tiny bit. Let's talk through drug therapy. Um, For type 1 diabetics, the the key drug uh, is going to be insulin, right? So we're the biggest... The biggest thing that we're doing with patients who have type 1 diabetes because it's an immune disease and because their beta cells are being destroyed is insulin replacement, right? Um, This is a lot different than type 2, but we will get there. Um, Insulin replacement is used in the management of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but I would say most often your type 2 diabetics are not using insulin replacement. They're using some sort of oral medication to help them manage their blood glucose. So we have human insulin produced. Um, We have several different insulin products on the market and they're going to differ in their onset and duration of action. And we're gonna talk about them in that way. So that's one treatment component and the necessary treatment component. Uh, Exercise is always, um, exercise is always going to be great for patients um, with, with diabetes. And then dietary intake is going to be extremely important, particularly if we remember that plate, right, where we had a very small portion of those being carbs. And then last but not least, patient adherence and self-monitoring blood glucose. So as we move forward, let's look at the this table. This table represents the many types of insulins that are available on the market. And there are key things that I that I think you should know. And so I will give those to you. Um, there are kind of four different types. I'm going to start with the types first because I think that's important. Four different types of insulins on the market. The first type is a rapid insulin. The second type is going to be a short insulin The third type is going to be an intermediate insulin. And then the fourth type is going to be a long kind of acting insulin. Your rapid and your short insulins are going to have very short onset of actions, which is great, right? So if we think about it from this perspective, look at that onset of action. We're talking 15 minutes to a half an hour. For the onset of action, we can see that the difference between your rapid and your short is that your short's going to take a little bit longer for the onset of action, right? It's also going to take a little bit longer to peak, yes? Your rapid's going to peak very quickly, but what do we know? When something has a short onset of action, what do we know about its duration of action? Correct, it's going to be shorter. So your rapid active acting insulin is going to be like your emergency insulin, essentially. That's the way that I think about it. It's going to have a short onset of action, right? It's going to have a short duration of action. Your um, short acting insulin, very similar, right? It's going to have a short onset of action with a long duration of action. Now we get into our intermediate. Um, This is your intermediate. It's going to take a little bit longer, about an hour to two hours to have a to have some type of effect. But if you look at the duration of action, guess what's gonna happen? It's gonna last a lot longer. And then last but definitely not least are your long acting insulins, which take about the same time to have an onset of action as your your intermediates. And then same thing, they last for a longer period of time. So when do we think you would take these? Preprandial, postprandial, during the day, that's also important, right? What do you think? Okay, since you pulled my arm, I will tell you. So, your rapid and short, when do you think they're used? Ready? One, two, three. Say it out loud. You can't be wrong in my class. Okay, if you said that your rapid and your short acting insulins are going to be used at mealtime, then you would be correct, right? They're going to be used at mealtime, or we could say preprandial, 
And the reason they're used preprandial is for what reason? Tell me, what are we trying to control? Good. We're trying to control the postprandial, right? Glucose in increase. So they play a major role in controlling increases in glucose after a meal, right? And that's a beautiful thing. They're short acting. They're going to not act for very long because their duration of action is relatively short, right? And then what about our intermediate or our long acting? When are we going to kind of use them? Good. If you said um, throughout the day to kind of maintain the the level of blood glucose level, then you would be correct. Now, I want to say, I say that to say this, that there are times that a physician will actually mix a rapid acting with an intermediate or a long acting, right? So then what you get is the postprandial um, balancing of glucose, but then you also have the sustained level of glucose with your intermediate and your long. So some of these drugs certainly are mixed. The other thing that we can think about is in a hyperglycemic state. Now I'm testing you. We have a patient who's in hyperglycemia. So we smell that, that fruity breath. Which type of insulin do you want that patient to take? Good. If you said rapid or short, you'd be correct. I'd even argue just your rapid because you're going to have a rapid. You're going to have a rapid onset, which means once that insulin hits, it's it's peak um on its onset of action is about 15 minutes or so so you're going to see a decline in blood glucose levels a decline in the signs and symptoms right if you have a patient in hyperglycemia and <laughs> you give them an intermediate or a long that would be just a terrible thing and i will have failed you as a professor in this pharmacology class so all in all, as we look at insulins that can be used for type 1 diabetics, the big key things to keep in mind are the types, right? And the onset of action and then the duration of action. And yes, um, you know, here's the deal. I could sit here and talk through all of these names, but the reality is we're not administering them. We do have to understand is the difference between a rapid, short, and intermediate, and long, and the onset of action and when those should be utilized, Right. If I'm getting ready to eat a meal, most often I'm going to take that rapid or short so that it will level out my postprandial glucose levels. For patients that will be using insulin to control blood glucose levels, um, first and foremost, insulin is not effective orally, so it's rapidly absorbed and therefore would not be um, good for patients with diabetes. So it's always administered in some sort of injectable form. And so there are multiple types of injectable form. The common one is going to be a syringe. The, the next common is a pen. And then we have insulin pumps, which are becoming way more popular, right? The insulin pumps tend to help patients um, adhere to their prescribed treatment when compared to your pins and your syringes but it's all about the patient's comfort level um, it's all about the patient's age and it's all about the physician each physician um, will kind of prescribe different treatments based on the patient right younger patients quite honestly the the goal is an insulin pump because it increases patient adherence syringe, there's fear of needles, etc. So this decision, whether or not it's a pin, a syringe, or a pump will be up to the patient and the physician. Most common concentration is at 100 units per milliliter. And then in terms of storage, which most often you won't be storing, but certainly is important for your patients, unopened vials in a refrigerator. Um, the vial that currently is in use may be kept at room temperature for a month. And then after that, you must um, discard, right? Okay, so if you are injecting insulin, so this presumes that your patient is not using an insulin pump. Most often, insulin pumps are placed two different places, on the deltoid muscle of the patient or in the abdominal region of the patient. Again, all about patient comfort, patient preference, physician preference. But we're talking injection sites, so we need to do an, an emergent injection of a rapid-acting 
um, insulin because our patient is hyperglycemic, for example, or if the patient has a pin or a syringe and that's their method for injecting insulin, the preferred injection sites are going to be, as you can see here, the arm, the side of the thigh, I like to call it the IT band region, the abdominal region, and notice the belly button is not in the blue. So um, you want anything outside of the belly button region in the abdominal region. The um, gluteal region is also another site of interest. Now I'll say all that to say that the preferred injection site is the abdominal region, tends to be the site where most absorption um, of insulin will occur at, at the greatest rate, I guess. Um, and so I guess it'll depend on the patient. If the patient is injecting multiple times per day, they may choose different injection sites because you get you get really sore, right, um, as you're injecting. The number one adverse side effect of a patient um, taking uh, insulin as a medication is going to be hypoglycemia. So in other words, they take too much of the insulin and a, that insulin takes all of the, the glucose circulating in the blood and creates a hypoglycemic um, environment for the patient. And so that's most often due to dosing error, which occurs in patients who have been recently diagnosed with diabetes. Um, once patients are used to dosing, then this dosing error typically doesn't happen. Could be an administration error. So example of that would be they uh, put too much in the syringe as they were loading it, did a double injection um, of the pin, for example, or... This is the one that I think will happen most in the field of athletic training. They have an unplanned change in um, exercise. So, you know, the coach who's upset because they lost the game the, the night before. And so they're just going to run the athlete into the ground the next day. So this would be an example of where we need to step in and protect them. Right. Um, so some concerns is that oftentimes, particularly athletes, if they're immersed in their sport, sometimes they don't even see the early warning signs of hypoglycemia. So there's this 15-15 rule of a patient who, had, who you suspect has hypoglycemia. Remember, hypoglycemia is defined as anything less than 7 milligrams per deciliter, right? So in that case, what we're going to do is test the blood glucose level, right? If it's below that 70, then we're going to have them eat 15 grams of fast acting carbs. Now I don't measure 15 grams. I just give them a candy bar or some Skittles and then in, wait 15 minutes and then you're going to reassess and you're going to keep doing that until we're at least at 70, if not above. Makes sense. So use the 15-15 rule in the clinical setting wherever possible. Now, one thing that we should warn our patients of, particularly those that were just recently diagnosed with diabetes, is that in fact, insulin therapy can absolutely cause cause weight gain. There's been several studies on this, right? Uh, one of the things that we know about a patient who is taking insulin as a treatment for diabetes um, is that because the insulin is now moving glucose again, um, the, that sometimes gets converted into excess or into fat. So if we have ex excess glucose, then that excess glucose gets converted into fat. So it is normal for a patient who has began insulin therapy to gain weight early on. But again, that can be controlled with what? exercise, right? So we have to make sure that our type 1 diabetic is also exercising, but for different reasons. Now, it is possible for a patient to have an allergic reaction to insulin, but they removed all insulin that was made with pork and beef. And so we are seeing less allergic reactions as a result of injections with insulin. Now, you can have lipoatrophy or lipohypertrophy, as the name implies, shrinkage. Um, of tissue around an injection site or increase in tissue around an injection site. It just depends on the actual patient. I already talked through this a little bit, um, but I will say that if you have an unconscious patient, because that can happen with a hypoglycemic patient, it's happened to me and it's very scary. Um, you can have, you can take these glucose tablets and um, sometimes what you can do is put it underneath their tongue um, but again, even then that might be hard. So it may require some parental glucose and or glucagon. What is parental? What does that mean? What it means is that glucose has to be injected uh, like an IV, for example, right? 
Um, you can't most often administer any type of anything to an unconscious patient. There are some dissolvable tablets that you can certainly put under the tongue and it can be absorbed in in the circulatory system. But the best way is through IV. So you're calling 911. You're letting them know you have a diabetic patient so that when they come, remember when we did our IVs, um, there were different types of IV bags that you could have. They'll give them the what's called the lactate ringer, essentially. The scariest part for me in teaching this was learning that there are so many drugs that can have an adverse effect on patients who are uh, taking insulin and then also that can alter blood glucose levels. So I created a table because I was lost just looking at it. So the category beta blockers, corticosteroids, beta, antagon beta agonist nasal decongestants, which we just talked about, the ones that contain pseudoephedrine, theozide, um, diuretics. Oh, look at that. Alcohol again. So what I'm going to do is say if a patient is on a beta blocker, so maybe they have high blood pressure, um, it can cause hypoglycemia. If a patient takes a corticosteroid, which we need to be aware of as an anti-inflammatory drug that is utilized in the field of athletic training, it can cause hyperglycemia. Ooh. Your beta agonist will cause hyperglycemia, your nasal decongestants, which is a, a good one to think about. If your patient is sick, what are the drugs that I'm giving them and what does it cause? Most often linked to hyperglycemia, diuretics, hyperglycemia, and then alcohol. We've already talked about this, hypoglycemia. So these are all key things to consider as you ask patients which drugs they might be taking in addition to obviously being a diabetic. Type 1 diabetics are relatively easy to treat, right? They get insulin. It's simple. But remember, we talked about type 2 diabetic diabetes being way more complex and that not only is it insulin, um, not only are we less sensitive, sensitive to insulin, but in addition to that, we have a reduction in several key hormones in the body, right? Our incretins, our um, glucagon, and our amylin. So then we have to find drugs that would act like those hormones that have been reduced, right? So treatment, we do diet and exercise, which I've talked a lot about already, so I won't bore you there. And the thing we're going to introduce now are the oral antibiotic drugs. So notice I said oral antibiotic or anti-diabetic drugs. Ha! Um, and so this is not insulin, right? We said insulin cannot be oral. So these are going to be different types of anti-diabetic drugs that our type 2 patients are going to be taking. Um, insulin it can um insulin can be used for type 2 diabetics but we don't use it very often and oral anti-diabetic drugs are not used for type 1 diabetics because it is an autoimmune disease not a hormonal issue so we have to figure out what type of drug is going to be best for our patients and so on the next slide you know how i roll by now um, I gave you a table, and here's what I'm going to tell you. You have to know category of drug, and then what you have to know are the characteristics associated with those drugs, and then the side effects. Okay, so I'm going to erase all of those, and I'm going to I'm going to do my best to say some of these drugs. So your sulfonylureas, okay not to be taken in a patient who has a sulfa allergy. So if they have a sulfa allergy, not taking this, okay? But these, are, again, oral drug, it's going to increase the release of insulin. That's great, right? If we increase the release of insulin, what do we hope will happen? Hopefully, we will trigger the insulin that's already sitting there to do what? Attach the receptors, allow glucose to attach to move into the cells. The biggest side effect associated with that is going to be hypoglycemia and then um, weight gain. Your glenides, those are also oral. They're going to increase the, the release of insulin. And the great thing is they help control postprandial, right? So think, I eat a meal, what's going to happen? Blood gl glucose level is going to go up. So they help control that spike in blood glucose level. So another side effect is going to be hypoglycemia. I'm not going to go through this whole entire list, okay? Because it's here and it's something that you're going to use to study. But there are several different category of drugs. Some of them 
are going to replicate the hormones that we've talked about that are inhibited. So I'm going to come down here to the incretin like drugs and the amylin like drugs. What does that mean? Number one, they're injected. They're going to increase the effect of the incretins or mimic the amylin effects, right? So it's going to increase insulin, decrease glucagon. The biggest thing is preserve the beta cell function, right? And then your amylin-like drugs, they're going to decrease glucagon, slow down glucose absorption, um, and reduce appetite, which can be a good thing, right? Remember, patients who um, suffer from type 2 diabetes most often are, I'll, I'll say it this way, maybe obese, right? And so reducing appetite leads to weight loss, which can be a great thing. We don't want drastic weight loss, but certainly could. And again, this is a good one to use because it's going to control the postprandial hyperglycemia that's associated with it. So what am I saying to y'all? There are a lot of categories of drugs that um, would work for a type 2 diabetic. The question that a physician most often asks his or him herself is really what is the goal of the therapy, right? If the goal is to control post uh, perandial hyperglycemia, right? They notice a patient who's suffering from that, then I'm going to choose one of these drugs. Does that make sense? If the goal is to um, decrease the insulin, insulin sensitivity, so insulin can bind to the cells, right? Then I'm going after my glitazones, right? So each of these drugs plays a major role. You have to decide what's causing the type 2 diabetes and then use the drug on this list to actually help that patient sitting in front of you. This is our final slide and it's no surprise that I'm going to talk through the role of the athletic trainer briefly because I've been doing that throughout. But key things that are important for us as healthcare practitioners, you have to be able to recognize the symptoms of uncontrolled diabetes, right? That could be, that could present itself as hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, right? Patient education is key. Never assume that because your patient has been diagnosed with diabetes, that the physician or the physician assistant or any other healthcare practitioner has really taken the time to help that patient understand their disease, right? And then be a source of encouragement. The reality is this is a lifelong disease. Um, and so uh, be their support where they need it. Key one is going to be be able to recognize hypoglycemia, right? Such a life-threatening condition. One of the things that every athletic training kit should have is some type of glucose, some type of candy, some type of sugary drink you choose, something we can give a patient who we suspect has hypoglycemia. Now, one thing that students always ask me is, what if we don't know if they're hypo or hyperglycemia? What I can tell you is, if you give, if you give more sugar to a patient with hyperglycemia, they are not going to die, right? Maybe they go through the process of ketoacidosis and their pH begins to drop, but you catch that before. But if you do not give glucose to a patient who is hypoglycemic, they can die. So if you are unsure, give the glucose either way, right? You're going to encourage regular medical exams. And for patients that are diabetics, remember that A1C test, you want to do that every three to four months. And then you really, the big key for type 2 diabetics in particular, because they suffer from decreased blood flow to the lower extremity, particularly the toes are the first to go in terms of amputation, appropriate footwear will be a good suggestion. All in all, I'm thankful that you've made it this far. Hopefully you're still tracking with me and then hopefully you understand the importance and the role of the athletic trainer in patients with diabetes.